Hey everybody, welcome to this episode of Compassion and Courage, Conversations in Healthcare. I'm your host, Marcus Engel. This is the podcast where I teach compassionate communication, provide perspective, and inspire resilience. All right, so my guest today, uh, just he says that he's just a nurse, but he's a lot more than that. So I'd like to welcome uh, Drew Acock to the show. Drew, thanks so much for being with me. Drew's a buddy too. So if we have some banter back and forth, uh, you understand why. How are you, man? Thanks for being I'm here. I'm doing good. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. So, so Drew, you said like you're just a nurse, but um, I, I got to give you more credibility than that. So if, if I were in the United States Air Force under your command, I would refer to you as... Lieutenant Colonel Acock. Lieutenant Colonel Acock. Okay, so Lieutenant Colonel AFRN with a specialty in mass casualty trauma, right? right. So I think a lot of people might be uh, familiar with the idea of flight nursing and trauma nursing, but this idea of mass casual, give me, give me a little bit more of a thumbnail about what's that look like and what did you study when you were doing that? So... Um... During the time I was at U.S. Transcom, um, our job was mass patient movement. Now, if you know anything about patient movement in the military, um, the Air Force can move one patient or an entire hospital of patient, depending on the scenario. Uh, during the time I was at Transcom, we did patient regulation, which means we cleared patients to move from one part of the world to the other part of the world on fixed wing aircraft owned by the Air Force. Um, during that time, we responded to several hurricanes. You might have heard of Katrina. You might have heard of Rita, Ike, Gustav. Um, when the Air Force is asked, when Department of Defense is asked, um, we drop aircraft and AE team, air medical evacuation teams, which is a medical team on the back of a fixed wing aircraft, into an area that has either a hurricane has passed or a hurricane is coming. And our job is to move mass numbers of patients, not, not, not refugees or, or normal people, patients out of harm's way or out of the damage zone. Um, while I was in Transcom, I decided that this is a cool degree to get because I wanted to be involved in it and I needed a degree. I needed a master's degree in order to make lieutenant colonel. I was a major at the time. So I, uh, I, I studied, I studied, I took a bunch of tests. I got my master's degree on, on an online, uh, on an online facility and, uh, I've been using it ever since I've been in and out of transcom since then. And now I'm working for air, uh, AMC air mobility command doing the airplane side of patient movement. And so that's based out of Scott air force base yeah. in Southern Illinois. And Headquarters your current, AMC your, is Scott. Yes, sir. Yeah. And, and so, so your current uh, position and role, what, what do you do in your current position? So I'm uh, I, right now I'm, it, it's kind of long winded, sorry, but it's, <laughs> it's the right. chief of global aeromedical evacuation branch for the 618th air operations center. That's got air force base and air operations center is a C2 entity, a command and control entity that moves cargo. It moves people, it moves patients from anywhere in the world to anywhere else in the world. AMC owns the 618th and the 618th is the only global aeromedical or sorry, global air operations center that Department of Defense has. It's the only one. We're the only one that move into and out of every theater in the world. That is huge macro scale sort of stuff. Thank you for job. thank you for explaining that. Uh, let's can we come back to a micro scale? Uh, one sure. of the questions I always ask pretty much anybody, and I know the answer to this for you. But um, why why did you choose a career in healthcare? Because you were were you military before nursing school? Everyone asks me that. Everybody asks me, were you military before nursing? Were you enlisted before you became an officer? No, um, no, I was just a guy. So um, in essence, I got into college straight out of high school to be an architect. And I, I, when I got to Calc 3 and linear algebra, I realized I cannot stand mathematics. Um, I switched to a biology major and became a nurse. My mother is a nurse. My aunt was a nurse. I have a lot of medical people nursing staff in my family. So it just made sense and it felt right. As soon as I got into, as soon as I got into nursing, it just kind of felt, it kind of felt right. And I knew, I knew as soon as I got into the field, I wanted to be ER trauma. There was no other place for me to be. 
and you started out doing that nursing ER trauma at Barnes at Hospital, the very where place you where met. you and I uh, may have met many years later. Yes, that's correct. I actually, so here's an irony. I started in the emergency department two weeks after your accident. Okay. So two weeks after my wreck. Yeah. So, yes, so you've got a long history here as a nurse too. Yes, sir. Yeah. That's incredible, Dan. And, and so, uh, so then military service. Yeah. So um, about four years into Barnes, um, I decided that uh, I needed to do something else. I, I was starting to get, so, so ER nursing, um, it's kind of a hamburger grinder. If you're not into it all the time, um, which I was, and it was starting to kill me. Um, I would work three to 11 shift, end up working all night, come back. They'd call me in early. So I was doing maybe 18 hours a day, five days a week, because there was so many needs and there were so many holes in the schedule. I finally decided I wanted to, I wanted to change, change tactics. So 1997, I decided that we're going to see what the air force has. So I signed up. Boy, were they happy. They were very happy. So they're like, hey, critical care nurse, because Barnes is a level one trauma center. And the Air Force recognizes level one trauma center experience as critical care experience. So I came into the military as a critical care nurse with a it's called a J designator. It means ER. Um, And I wanted I came in to fly and do something different. And the first thing they did was send me to the only level one trauma center in the Air Force and uh, worked in the ER. So in essence, I was doing exactly the same thing. Just put the uniform on every day. And where, where were you first stationed? My first assignment, like everybody else that came in when I did, was Wilford Hall in San Antonio, Texas. Very good. My uh, daughter-in-law is currently getting her CRNA there right cool. now through the Very VA. Cool. So I know San Antonio holds a lot of uh, a lot of military hearts that hold the uh, San Antonio and I'll be in with their you. military hearts. I spent four years there. The food is glorious. Sometimes in the summer, it's like walking around on the surface of the sun, but San Antonio is a fantastic place and I do not regret going there as my first assignment. Awesome. Awesome. So, and, and we should, we should also point out here that you, th- you certainly would think of flight nursing and trauma nursing with the military, but we also have to keep in mind the several years that you spent as a nurse at Barnes in the early nineties, when things were significantly more violent, maybe than they were for the next 20 years or more, 30 years. Yes. Um, did did that experience in the ER well prepare you for what you would be doing later with soldiers' lives instead of civilians? So uh, here's a here's a side note. So when I got into the military, um, or sorry, when I got into the ER after nursing school, um, I wanted to absorb everything all at once. I wanted to do and see everything, and we had some great preceptors in that emergency department. Um, at the end of, I'd say about my mid tour at Barnes, I call it a tour because that's what the military calls it, but my mid time at Barnes, I thought that a farming accident was the worst thing that could ever happen to a human being. And then I went to war and it's not even close. Um, but to answer your question, I value more than anything else experience. So when I came out of Barnes and dropped into Wilford Hall as a lieutenant, um, and Lieutenant Butterbars are not supposed to know anything, but when I came down there, I came with level one trauma experience that you can only get in certain cities, violent cities. I, I say violent. St. Louis is a great place to live, but it does have its bad side. So um, when I walked into that unit, I humbled myself because, you know, you're a lieutenant, so everybody's ordering you around. But the experience that I gained at Barnes was priceless, priceless. And I'll be honest with you, the experience I gained working as a student at Barnes on an on an orthopedic floor was priceless in getting my RN because it, I can read a book cover to cover and lose everything by the end of the book. But if you show me how to do something, I'll remember it for the rest of my life. And I, I learn visually. And in that emergency department, you it's it's geometric learning every direction. 
And yet you said even that learning, even the trauma cases that you witnessed at a level one didn't prepare you anything for what you would see coming out of a war zone. Marcus, I cannot, I, I cannot describe in visceral detail the amount of injuries, massive injuries that a live person survived. Um, I have seen such horrific injuries deployed. Um, I've done a, I've done tours in Afghanistan. I've done tours in Iraq. In the in the in in both cases, I was Aravac. But when you're in a when you're in a small setting like Kandahar, and it is a relatively the the medical facility in Kandahar is relatively small, and you are a critical care nurse, you are pulled into those emergency departments when those patients come in to assist while they prep to go on an Aravac mission. So. The injury, I cannot describe probably on this venue, um, the horrific injuries that I've seen that people have lived through and are still living today, some of them. Sure. So, so this brings up a little bit of a dichotomy, right? So, so your profession of nursing, we, we think of nurses being the most trusted profession in America, and we think of nurses as these compassionate loving, caring individuals, yet we've got this dichotomy, right, that you're doing this work for American soldiers who are going out trying to, you know, do warfare. So so when you received these soldiers, these soldiers that were eaten up from the battlefield or uh, massive injuries, and you're air flighting them uh, to the nearest uh, the nearest, I guess, you tell me what the terminology is, the nearest hospital presence, yeah. um, military hospital presence. What is, how do you, how do you provide compassion to those in such a traumatic time when the stakes are so high? This is, you know, let this me, isn't med surgeon me, nursing on the floor. This is combat trauma. It is. Um, let me put it to you this way. When I worked at Barnes, we would get patients in that were, let's just say, affiliated with gangs, often shot up. Um, we would get inner city folks that came in on drugs, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that prepared me for being in the back of an aircraft and receiving patients that were shot up. But understand, you are in the same uniform as the person laying in front of you. That is maybe two days ago is somebody you saw at the BX grabbing a cheeseburger before they just went out on a, uh, a convoy or something. These people wore the same uniform, took the same oath. It is literally your brother and sister laying in front of you. It is not hard. It is not hard to be compassionate and caring for a soldier who put his life on the line to protect, even protect me in a forward operating base or at an air base. So when the army guys go out on convoy and they bring in a third of their guys that are shot to hell, it, it, it's automatic. It, there, there's no, you don't think about, well, these guys went out to hurt somebody. No, this is your brother wearing the same outfit you are that is in pain, probably the worst day of his life. And you were there to make it better and make sure, be honest with you, we're there to make sure they don't die. Mm -hmm. the, the, the injuries they receive, we're literally there to make sure they don't die. And in the back of an aircraft, so it, we, we, we never talked about that. In the back of an, your average AeroVac aircraft, you do not have a doctor unless there is a, what's considered a, a critical care patient. In that case, you'd have a critical care air transport team. There's a doc, a nurse, and a tech. But your average evac that does not have a critical care uh, injury to it will not have a doctor on board. So you have a nurse and two techs. That's what we flew in in Kandahar and Iraq. We flew with a, uh, a bridged crew, one nurse, two techs. Um, if you have a physician on board, it's because there's critical care patients and they're responsible for those patients. So uh, trying to get you to understand, sometimes you don't have a doc on board, so you're it. You are not only in command of everything behind the cockpit, as long as there's a patient in there, but those patients' lives are in your hands and in your tech's hand. And some people are made for emergency and trauma nursing like you. 
but everyone, I think, it, who works in any capacity of healthcare is still still dealing with time limitations, right? You've got to, like you said, you, you may not have a doctor on board. You may not have enough uh, of the professionals that you need on board at that moment. So how then, when you're running codes and dropping blood in, and how do you keep it all going? How can you show, how do you, how do you truly convey compassion, that compassion that you feel to your brother or sister that's laying there injured? How do you do that? So it, are we talking I remember, military, let's, are we let talking me harken back setting? to something. Let, let me harken back to something that I heard you say at a conference several years ago, which is that you'd get these, you get these soldiers in there. And we certainly know that there's these, uh, these, these systems of hierarchy throughout the military. And yet I remember you talking about your patients who would walk, walk up and say, Hey, I'm Drew. I'm your nurse. Not I'm, major yeah. or colonel or lieutenant colonel, but, but using your first name, which kind of brought you down to be on the level where they were. Well, I, I have been in a setting and it was Wilford Hall. Wilford Hall is a training base for active duty, basic trainees. And I have actually had a nurse in front of me order someone to lay at attention. Now, realistically what he was trying to do is tell that airman basic don't screw around in the room and when he was screwing around the room he had to order him back into you're in training you're never out of training while you're here not even at the hospital so um i've never been that guy now i won't say that i haven't been assertive uh in 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 in, in a trauma setting during a resuscitation when i see things going wrong or i have to call the room back into reality when the patient's going down the drain and not everybody is seeing that. But um, in the back of an aircraft, when you are addressing a two stripe army guy or Navy guy who sees the rank on your, well, realistically, when we flew, the only rank would be at the here because everything else is stripped. You, you flew sterile. Um, But when I'd walk up and say, my name's Drew, I'm your nurse. Um, I'm here to take care of you. Is there anything I can do for you right now? Are you comfortable? Do you need meds? Do you need pain meds? They would always say doc. They call you doc. (laughs) If you're a nurse, everybody gets called doc in the back of the plane. Even my med techs would be called doc by the army. Now the air force people, they know the difference between a nurse and, and, and techs. Although realistically, except me being older, you can't really tell. Um, but again, it's coming down to the patient's level and realizing that they're injured or hurt. We re- I realize they have to maintain discipline, but in the back of an aircraft, when you are headed towards another hospital and you've got 35 patients in that aircraft that all need to be addressed, I don't have time to have them worry about calling me, sir. I, I have to, I have to manage my time as fast as possible and get them the best care as possible. And again, I keep saying this, nobody gets better at altitude. So my job is to make sure nobody gets worse at altitude. And, and, and for, for lay people like me, what do you mean when you say nobody gets better at altitude? When you go up to an, alt- an 8,000 foot cabin altitude, that's the pressurization in the aircraft. If you're in the back of a cargo aircraft, it's loud, it's vibrations, it's cold, um, and you're in a state of hypoxia. Well, when you're in a state of hypoxia, you're not getting better. So um, even even people who don't require, you've been on a long flight. You get off that flight, you're exhausted. Try to imagine a patient who's already exhausted from the injury going on a three-hour flight from Kandahar to, well, it's not Kandahar to Bagram. That was an hour flight. But from Bagram back to launch tool, which is a more like a 10 hour flight, getting off that plane. Now you've, all you've heard the whole time was the, the roar of the engines, the cold and heat, cause that aircraft is impossible to keep hot everywhere. And it vibrates, everything vibrates. So your body is under constant barrage of, of senses. Your senses are being beat to death. You are physically exhausted when you get off that plane as a nurse flying in the back of it. 
I'm exhausted at the end of the mission. Mm -hmm. I cannot imagine being a patient all coming on board that aircraft and not feeling like you can't sleep. You, you, it, you're exhausted before you get on. I can't imagine what happens at the end. So that's what I mean by nobody gets better at altitude. You're in a hypoxic environment. It's loud. It's noisy. It's there's, there's sometimes there's fumes in the back of that aircraft. If it's a KC 135 <laughs> anyways, uh, but you, you just, you don't get better at altitude. You just don't, we, we try to make sure you don't get worse. I, I, I just, I can't even imagine, like, like you said, being on a long flight, even flying commercial, even in first class, you're tired when you get off that plane, much less a patient who's. And those are well loss. insulated, so, well insulated, yeah. well pressurized commercial aircraft that are meant to keep you as comfortable as possible. I, I've, I've shown pictures of litters. It's basically a piece of cloth strapped between two big poles. Not the most comfortable place to, even if you're laying down, it's still not the most comfortable place to lay for 10 hours straight. Amazing. Amazing. And to, to think that you were uh, helping guide those first steps of through traumatic healing for our servicemen and women. That's thank you for your service. Thank you for also taking care of our service. Just doing members. my job. Absolutely. Just doing my job. That's what I always hear from you, but it's a lot more of a job than, than many of us will ever, will ever experience or know. So I, I, I'd love to ask you about um, what, what were some of the, the situations that you found yourself in when you were actually doing mass casualty response? Like you said, before Katrina came to New Orleans, you were helping evacuate patients, right? No, was it Katrina was an after event. After event for Katrina. So okay. We were on the ground in 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 New Orleans airport uh, after the uh, we, we got there two days after the after she blew over. Um the, and the reason that reasons aside, so the reason the only way we get there is if the state asks for help. They didn't ask for DOD support until after the event. So we got there afterwards. Now we staged aircraft early. Um, but so Katrina was a benchmark of learning for how we are supposed to do things and the mistakes made early on. Mm -hmm. What was happening in that airport is helicopters, ambulances were told that is the jump off point to get on a military aircraft to be evacuated out of the area. So they were bringing people in from hospitals that had no power. Half of them were underwater on the bottom floors. Um, people that had all kinds of people with all kinds of ailments, some of which we're talking, some of the hospitals we eva they evacuated were like geriatric facilities where mm -hmm. people didn't speak. They were just there. Um, and they all flooded in. So it was our job to figure out what was wrong with them and get them on an appropriate aircraft with the appropriate amount of health care on board that aircraft. Meaning I can't put 25 critical care patients on the back of a C-130. The requirements for electrical, the requirements for oxygen, it would overwhelm the aircraft. So we had to marry up non-critical with critical on board an aircraft that can carry five critical and 30 non-critical on litters. And these aircraft were geared for maximum litters, meaning maximum beds. So that was our job on the ground there for, for to try and make sure those patients didn't die at altitude or didn't get worse at altitude. And again, some of the patients, so normally when you transfer a patient, you get report from the hospital sending, you know, a little bit about that patient, just enough to make it safe. And then you give that information to the nurse sitting on the back of the aircraft. We had nothing. We had people show up without name tags that were just brought in by a helicopter brought into our area, staged, and then we had to send them out. We were handwriting manifests. I actually remember having a manifest that said woman in pink pants because we didn't have any other information other than the fact that she was wearing pink pants. 
So the, the manifest said woman in pink pants, man in green shirt and blue shoes, blah, blah, blah. Because the people that were being brought in, some of them didn't have any identification. You know, all their all their worldly possessions were left in the hospital and there was no name tags. So again, that was extremely challenging. Now we've gotten better um, for a short period of time. The uh, uh, DOD wanted to be notified early so that we could move people out of harm's way before the event got there. Now, the problem with that is a, a perfect example was Hurricane Ike. Hurricane Ike was headed towards the Texas coast up high to Galveston. Sorry, up down low. Um, to, was it Black uh, Corpus? It was around Corpus. So prior to that hurricane getting there, the, uh, the, the, in Texas, it's the, it's the judge that, that presides over the area of Texas and the facility uh, OIC or, or, or CEO that makes the decision to evacuate. So that hurricane's coming in. They decided to evacuate all these patients through Corpus. And then that hurricane took a hard right turn and headed toward Galveston. So I have all these patients staged to leave sitting on a flight line in the back of an ambulance. Some of them are critical care on ventilators. And the, when, that, when that hurricane turned, the CEO of the hospital and the judge ordered all of those patients to be returned to the hospital, even though the state, EOC, was saying, we need them to get on the aircraft because we need the ambulances to go up to Galveston to evacuate those hospitals. So it was a mess. So wow. after that, after Ike, we, they kind of did an about face. So states now don't ask for help unless there has been damage to the point of their infrastructure where they need DOD support. Wow. So now it's an after event instead of a pre event. Wow. Drew, this is awesome. This is awesome. And I feel like I could continue to talk to you for hours as we have done many, many times. <laughs> yeah. um, you talked a little bit earlier about, about, the ways that, that you bring yourself and your rank down to the level of, of your patients. Um, one, of the, one of the questions that I ask uh, all of my guests and one of, the, uh, one of the questions that I start out every semester with my pre-meds is to share a story about a time that someone was there for you or that you were there for another person. And I'm sure you've got millions of stories about ways that you were there for, I, uh, for uh, your fellow airmen and uh, fellow service members. Is there, is there a story that comes to mind when I, when I ask you, can you think about a time that somebody was there for you? Well, how about we do the other way that I was there okay. for someone, because I, I have sure. something in mind that is quite unique to, the situation at hand. My first deployment, my first combat deployment was into Kandahar, Afghanistan. Well, sorry, it was in Bagram at first. Bagram is the, uh, it sits in a bowl at 5,000 feet. Um, it was in the news because uh, we evacuated Bagram right before Kabul happened. And that was the staging area. So anyways, it's about an hour north, I think it's north of Kandahar. About a uh, month into my deployment, they moved me down to Kandahar, me and my team down to Kandahar, because the ops tempo in, Can in the area around Kandahar was getting hot. Um, there was a lot of conflict down there. Now, this was right before we, we invaded Iraq or, or we, uh, the Iraq war started. How about that? And we're talking so, the um, first Iraq war. We're talking the first time well, we were going to, We were sitting in Kandahar when the first tanks rolled over into Iraq. We were watching in a Connex on a TV. So I'm talking that time frame. It was 2002 and three, between two and three. So um, we got, uh, so I'm AE. So I sit in a tent waiting for a patient to come in that needs to move to a higher level of care. So Kandahar is a lower level of care. Bagram is my combat support hospital. So they're a higher level of care in, in essence. So let's get to the story. We got notified that there was a fire bombing. I believe it was a fire bombing. Uh, there was a lot of, uh, and this didn't hit CNN too much, but the number one export in Can out, of, out of Afghanistan when I was there was poppy seeds. Mm -hmm. We all know what poppy seeds are used for. So um, there was a lot of 
By drug. the way, poppy seeds are not used for bagels. They are used to produce Yeah, the other bagels. kind of poppy seeds. Right. right. So um, there was a lot of, uh, um, how do you call it? So you had a, a drug entity over here and a drug entity over here, and they were always fighting. We got notified that a woman and um, a, a father and mother and child were brought in uh, because they were, the, the house was firebombed. Um, she was burned pretty severely. The father ended up dying in Kandahar and there was a five-year-old child with him. Uh, the kid was not hurt, but had nowhere to go. So um, we were tasked, we, we got notified that we're going to move this woman from Kandahar to Bagram, which was on average hour and 20 minute flight on a C-130 J or uh, H model. Um, we, uh, we got notified that they, they didn't have an aircraft at the time. So my, uh, the C2 entity that was there pulled one out of the sky. Basically there was one flying around on a mission and we told it to land because we had a patient to move. Now C-130s can be reconfigured. They all have the equipment in them to configure, to carry patients. They all have that capacity and they're pretty much standardized. Well, this one was a J model. Now that's important because they fly a lot faster. So this guy lands and we go in to configure the aircraft. We get it set up for one critical care patient. The CCAT doc, the critical care air transport doc and nurse, was part of our team. They were attached to us. So they bring the patient out, and she's pretty bad. She's got a tube in her mouth, and IVs going. She's got burn dressings everywhere. And then this five-year-old kid gets brought on board by one of the Ravens. Um, sorry, a Raven is a... Uh, in essence, it's a guy in uniform with a bunch of guns that's meant to protect, that's supposed to protect the aircraft. That's its only job is to protect the aircraft. So he carries his five-year-old kid on board who is absolutely terrified. So it's obvious he had never been in a vehicle before and definitely never been in a plane before, had no idea what was going on, but he's a five-year-old kid. And his mom's hurt. And his mom is very badly hurt. So um, I can tell you this. Let me, let me jump back just a little bit. This is my first combat deployment. I went through all kinds of training to get prepared for it. Uh, Sea Bernie training where they teach you how to survive chemical warfare and all that fun stuff. What they do not tell you is the amount of children you are going to see in war. They do not tell you that. We were presented with lots of children. This particular kid was not injured, but was terrified. So we put the, we bright, we bring the mom in, we get her buckled into the, uh, into the mechanism that holds the litter and we sit the child down kind of close to her head, but far enough away that he wouldn't be in the way. Now he kept trying to get up and that's a bad thing when you're flying. So I had me and two of my med techs, they were working on helping CCAT prep all this stuff. I'm getting the aircraft ready, getting a report from the, the doc on board because I gotta, I've got to do some documentation as well. And I, I sit across from the kid, okay? Um, we take off, and the first time this ever happened, happened on this flight. So we're get, we, Bagram has a big, long flight line that the aircraft takes off and it climbs very quickly to a higher altitude because ground fire can't hit them as easily. What was happening is the bad guys, whoever they are, uh, were propping up these previously left rockets, pointing them towards where they think it will go and then lighting a fire underneath it. It's like a bottle rocket. It's going to go up, might hit, might not. So about 6,000 feet on ascent, um, I have a headset like this on, not like this, but I have a headset like this on, and I hear the pilot yell, evade. Now, I don't know if that was a reaction or what. Now, we're buckled in. The aircraft lays on its side, pulls up hard. You hear flares go off, and in the back of a C-130, flares being fired, if you're sitting on a wheel well, sound like a shotgun blast going off. I'm startled. I kind of think I know what's going on. And I look over at this child who is inconsolable now, just crying to beat scared. the band. So scared. Yeah. Aircraft levels off. We get above, we get above, an, we get to an altitude where they can't reach us anymore. And I jump up and I come down and I sit next to him and I, you know, I'm a dad. So I'm trying to calm him down. He's not really calming down. He's trembling. It's cold. You know, these kids, 
have never seen an aircraft, so they don't know what they don't know what they're doing. They they think that the back of the aircraft is going to open back up and they're going to get back out where they took off where they left from. So um, <laughs> here's where the story gets a little funny. So I, I'm I'm trying to console this child, and he's not having it. Well, when I deploy, there are certain times when you have downtime between missions. You land, your mission finishes, then you have to, it's called crew rest. You have to go into crew rest. Now, I'm a, I don't sleep, and I definitely did not sleep on deployment. So I have to take something that keeps my mind busy. Well, I, <laughs> with me on my, in my flight suit, I have a Game Boy Advance, and it's got Super Mario in it because, yeah, I'm a kid, whatever. I, I play video games. So I pop, I remember I have it. I pop this thing out. I flip it open. You can't hear it, but you can see it. So I, I lean down to where the kid can see the screen and I start playing Mario. And what I hear is the crying slowly stops. I look over at him and he's staring at the screen. I can tell he's never seen cartoons. He's never seen anything like this. And at one point when Mario stepped on the mushroom and got big, he actually laughed. Yeah. So I sat and I played, the, the, the flight was about 50 minutes. So I sat and I played that game for probably 30 minutes while he's staring at it. And when the pilot says, we're getting ready to land, I have to, I have to check the, air, the, the back of the airplane, make sure everything's secure. Uh, so I, I, I handed it to him. Now, okay, when you hand a video game to a kid who's never seen anything like this, probably has never seen a TV, um, he just stared at the screen, which was on pause with a big Mario right in the middle. And he's just staring at it. So I came back. I sat back down to him and I'm like, okay, we got to buckle in. We're going in. He seemed to calm down. And I don't, I don't cue that up as my fault. I'm, I'm giving all the props to Mario because all he did was watch that little screen, which was, you know, it's about that big. It's tiny. Um, but it took his mind off everything. And um, we got to the point B without him coming apart. Um, now all this time we're trying to we're, we're trying to calm down because we just got fired on. We knew that um, that didn't happen too often in Kandahar, but it a couple of times when we left and one when we came in, um, it's a terrifying experience because you have zero control in the back of that aircraft. So, anyways, uh, it turned out okay. The mother evidently lived. Um, she was scarred. But she lived, and I never saw him again. Yeah, yeah, just that brief. Which is right? that's how that's how an ER that's how an ER nurse is. You, you never yeah. see him again, unless they come back for a new problem. Right. But we we right. never saw again. I did hear because uh, we you know we get reports from the hospitals. So like, what happened to this particular patient? We'd ask about him. Like, oh yeah, we sent that we sent that young lady to a a, a, a different hospital, but she she was she survived. Great, awesome. Man. So that's what a, what a great story. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. So video uh, games are good for some people. Absolutely. So, yeah. Contrary you, to popular you, belief. You know, we, we use the, the definition of compassion um, at Notre Dame. We talk about witnessing suffering, being moved by that suffering, uh, having a desire to eliminate that suffering and then actually doing something. Right. And all of yeah. those things were, exactly what you were doing there it's and, just it's it's different when it's children yeah I mean, it really i mean so sometimes you're put into a moral dilemma you know, when you've got when you've got a patient who is a heavy drug user heavy alcoholic that comes in for bleeding from cirrhosis of the liver and you are you're tasked to care for that person you know that that person did that to themselves, but you're still tasked to care for them. When it's a child, completely different scenario. Yeah. Nine times out of 10, that child not, did nothing, nothing to warrant what happened to them. And, you know, when I, when I think about kids I've taken care of over the years, and I'm not a pediatric nurse, I have been put in situations where I had to take care of kids. Wolford Hall was one of them. They took peds. Uh, when I worked at Barnes, yeah. If a pediatric patient showed up in the ER, I'm like, yeah, right across the street, I'll help you get over there. We're going over to children's. Mm -hmm. um, but when it's a child, it is a completely different story. And I'll be honest with you, I'm not a peds nurse, but those people have a special place in heaven. 
Mm, mm -hmm. So true. So true. Hey, I got a couple of rapid fire questions for you before we close out today. You ready? Completely yeah. random. All right. Okay. Well, not really completely random. I ask a lot of people these same questions. Okay. So, uh, so let's think back to your 16 years old, right? Yep. You're 16. It's uh, it's after school one day. You're hanging out with your friends, or you're coming home from practice. Uh, those kind of things. What are you and your buddies listening to when you're 16 years old? Uh, well, uh, I can tell you this: when I'm 16, I burned out three of these cassettes. Um, Def Leppard. 100 percent right. and i still listen to them today nice nice favorite album hysteria is there any other hysteria yeah it's kind of hard to kind of hard to beat right kind of hard to beat kind of hard to beat awesome and I, I i know you're a big uh concert goer and i know you got to see them a year or two ago i hope that was pretty cool i try to go see def Leppard. i have this thing so uh, one of my box checks so i got a bucket list before i die uh, one of them was filled two years ago when I jumped out of a plane because I've been in the military this whole time and I've never jumped out of an aircraft. Uh, mm -hmm. But I finally jumped out of a, not a military plane. I had to pay for this myself, but I jumped out of a plane with a parachute and everything was fine. One of my box checks in life is to shake the hand of the drummer from Def Leppard. Yeah. I have followed him from his accident uh, throughout his career. I think except for you, he is probably the best example of how you overcome a massive ailment injury and become best in the world. That's like you, yeah. dude. Between you oh, and him, two of my that. heroes. <laughs> I appreciate that. And you're one of mine too. And so I got one last question for you, but before we do that, I do want to uh, tell the, tell the, the podcast audience, uh, many of you know that uh, whenever my previous CNI dog Garrett retired, uh, that he was immediately adopted by two people that are very special to me, um, Drew, the husband of the clan. So Drew uh, kept Garrett for the next several years until he crossed the Rainbow Bridge. So, uh, man, I thank you again for, for taking care awesome of my dog. dog in his golden years. He was an awesome dog. Awesome dog, man. Thank you again. You're welcome. And so last, last question for you, Drew. Uh, let's say that you've got the tallest billboard on the highest mountain in the world. and You get to broadcast your message or your mantra, whatever you want humanity to know. What goes on that billboard? Interesting. What goes on that billboard? I think probably the statement would be care more for each other because yeah. literally we've all, we've, we're all we got. And yeah. if people, you know, you watch the news, it's depressing. Um, I, I, I think that if we cared more about each other, just random strangers, um, it, it, it would be a better place and a lot easier place to live in. Yeah. I'm yeah. not political, so I'm not going to get into that. Mm. I'm a, tactical nurse. I'm not a political person at all, but caring for each other is probably the first step to making this world better. Absolutely. And sometimes that's a hump. Absolutely. All right. Well, Drew, Lieutenant Colonel Drew Acock, thank you so much for spending some time with me today. I uh, look forward to seeing you again, hopefully in the not too distant future. And listeners, thank you for being with us for this episode. This is Compassion and Courage, Conversations in Healthcare. I'm your host, Marcus Engel, and this is the podcast where I teach compassionate communication, provide perspective, and inspire resilience. Please, please remember, if you have not already, to subscribe to the podcast, share it, uh, like it, do all those kind of social media interactive things. Appreciate you all, and we'll see you next time. Thanks, buddy. Thank you.